out there at the penitentiary, I've shared this before, if you had 15 different guys sitting around a Bible study table, you would have probably about seven different denominational backgrounds. And a lot of folks, uh, they're really not students of the Word. They never have been. They, they do not read the Word. Devotionals are great. I, we, Rob and I do a lot of devotional. But they are no substitute for being a student of the Word. And so a lot of folks, the only thing that comes out of their mouth is their denominational spiel because that's, they just, they learn to parrot that. There was the cutest little thing on, on the internet the other day. It was, it was like a newspaper folded up and there was a little bird underneath it. And a little bird would stand up and go, peek a And then he'd, then he'd bow back down pretty soon. Right. You know, that was, I chuckled, it was, it was, it was like, it was funny. Uh, but, it's like a lot of Christians, we just parrot what we have heard. If you ask somebody what they believe, it's just their, it's what they heard somebody else say, it's the lyrics, it's the devotional, it's the denominational spin, this is the church I grew up in. And they're not, again, really students of the Word. Let's look at, in, in this context of this verse, let's, let's jump up and read 14, and then we're going to drop back and read 16. So out of the second chapter of 2 Timothy, verse 14 says this, Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. <laughs> which does no good but only ruins the hearer. Verse 16. But avoid irreverent babbling, or babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. We often get really concerned with the peripheral. Which is just simply more our spin. It's again, it's we've listened to somebody, we grew up in this denomination. You know, denomination isn't all bad, but denomination isn't all good. And that's just simply the truth. We need organization. That, that, that's 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 a given. Without organization, how are you going to, to to raise the finances to push people around the world the gospel to build the publishing houses? To have the, the TV, the, the radio stations, how are you going to do it? Because a few people just meeting somewhere in somebody's living room ain't going to do it. And that's just the truth. So you need, you need organization. But sometimes organization gets, they just get stuck. And, and they don't have that fresh word from the Lord. Uh, the argument is about meaningless stuff. It, mostly, it's the stuff in the in our Bible study this Wednesday. One of the things that was kind of interesting that, that she shared was a timeline, and uh, uh, she she said she holds a PhD. She's Harvard trained. She teaches in a Bible school, and uh, she's a brilliant lady, and. Uh, one of the ways that Bible scholars have tried to date things is they try to do it with genealogies. It's like, it, but you will notice, and she brings up if you if you read the genealogy of Matthew and the one in the Luke, in Luke, they're different. And so her point was: is 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 Matthew lying or is Luke? Is Luke telling the truth or is Matthew lying? I mean, they talk about, one talks about 14 generations from such and such, and another one talks about 21, and the world says, wow, there's contradictions in your book. But she said, one of the things that we don't understand about the Bible is that, that, that uh, God doesn't go uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The genealogies are based on who is important in the story. Not everybody is listed in the genealogy. That's just how they did it. 
And so if you're trying to figure out a timeline by counting genealogies, you're going to have a messed up timeline. That's just the truth. Uh, we know that there were, she says there were five major players. There was, there was, there was Adam, there was Noah, there was Abraham, there was Moses and David. That is the five major players of the Old Testament. That's the five major players. <clears throat> so Abraham, with, with a little bit of trying to figure out exactly say like where his story fits, they, they believe that he fits in the Bronze Age, and they do it by the archaeological stuff, not just not just the genealogy. It's like here is Ur of the Chaldees, here is Haran, this is the, the Fertile Crescent, this is where he traveled, these were the nations, they were in, in, in that land bridge, it was Canaan, and then it was it was it would later become Israel, and then it would later become Palestine, and down here said Egypt. So somewhere about the Bronze Age, here is uh I don't know. And there are some that are just Walk in to the dispensational timelines. I don't know what God's been up to for eons, did you? We love technology. Did you watch the thing with the, the landing of this latest rover on Mars? The pictures are phenomenally clear. Do you know that for seven minutes they had absolutely no contact with that that that, uh, that thing as it was getting ready to take and enter the atmosphere for seven minutes? So everything that I mean, I think these people live in a different world than me. They're, they're brilliant. That that for those seven minutes they had to figure the gravity. Uh, they had to figure the atmosphere. They had to plan its landing spot. I mean, we know there are certain places that even an airplane out of emergency can't land, huh? Yeah. There's obstacles. All of these things had, the technology is absolutely mind-boggling. This last week, they actually, you could go on and you could click and actually it sent back what Mars sounded like. That was the coolest thing of, of all. I mean, to click it and actually listen so this, this, little, this little, I think it was three or four minutes, whatever it was, that you got to actually hear what it sounds like on Mars. That's unbelievable. That's really unbelievable. That's mind-boggling. We can embrace science, unless it disagrees with our field. Do you know they put Galileo in prison? you know why they put Galileo in prison? He contradicted what the church said about the... He contradicted the church. You know what he said? Galileo said, the earth rotates around the sun. And the known science that the church co-signed the note of said, oh no, the sun rotates around the earth. Well, who was right? Did it change the gospel narrative? I mean, in Galileo's time, would it have changed the gospel narrative? My God, if we teach that, people aren't going to get saved and born again. Huh? No, that, that, that's, that's craziness to assume that. And yet, we're locked into this little timeline in our doctrine, and so then we... We bicker, and we argue, and we get angry, and frustrated. It was kind of cool, Carrie, my son-in-law, was out at the, the Labor Day camp out. He's been there twice. He brought his little, his little iPhone with a program on it, where he position the stars, and then he has his little printer, not, not printer, pointer. So it's like, the kids really enjoyed it. Okay, so find the North Star. You know, okay, where's the Big Dipper? Over there, you know. It's like, what is that over there? That's a star. No, it's Jupiter, you know. That was kind of fun. 
If you had a 6,000 year narrative, light travels 186,000 miles. That's actually like 186,242, somewhere in there, miles per second. And my galaxy alone is millions of light years across. I can only see, I guess I got 6,000 years worth of light. I shouldn't even be seeing those lights yet. With the Hubble, they're actually watching stars die and stars being birthed, and yet it happened mm. how long ago? Huh. So if I, if I argue about that, does it change the gospel narrative? No, it doesn't change the gospel narrative. In fact, it's kind of fun in a way, because in a way, what it does, it's like, it begins to take that one little page in the front of your Bible, only usually about half, you know, it's not even half front and back. If you go to Genesis 1, it's just, hey guys, this is how God did it. It actually makes it begin to come alive. Is there bad science? Absolutely. Is there good science? We're enjoying the benefit of it, huh? You enjoy your iPhone? Huh? Do you enjoy do you enjoy all of the modern conveniences? The cemeteries were full of people that died simply in days gone by because what a simple procedure today would have uh, yeah. you know solved. And so my point simply begins to be this. You need to study the Word for yourself. Huh? Whatever that may mean. Do you know that there's, there's, there's other, that there, there's actually historians that write that you can read along with your Word? I mean, it, study the Word, it, it, you know, is, it can be a, a, a really an exciting adventure as you begin to, I mean, read and really study. Somebody read for me really quick, Hosea 4.6. Just stand and get it when you got it. Hosea 4.6. You just have to read the first part. Don't read the whole verse. Just, just the first sentence. I got it. Okay, read it, Captain. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Yeah. Okay. It says, my people are destroyed. Uh, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. You ever hear that little adage? It's like, what you don't know won't hurt you. Yeah. That's about dumb, isn't it? Yeah. What you don't know can kill you. <laughs> there was a day in this country when you know the doctor's operating on, on you and he's scratching his hair and the cheeks on his bum and you know. And, and the nurse probably washed some of the instruments in the sink with the morning dishes. And we didn't have the microscope, and so we didn't know that. He was flat infecting you with a whole bunch of bacteria that probably end up losing the limb or dying from the operation. Right? So what you don't know will kill you. And that's what he's saying. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And how do you come by the knowledge? Through the Word. Here it is. I like it. Amen. You need to become a student of the Word. Amen. On a daily, regular, consistent basis. Then you will be able to Rightly divide, as Timothy said, huh? yeah. the word. <coughs> You'll begin to understand what's yours, what's your rights, what's your privilege. You'll learn about all kinds of things. Do you really know what belongs to you? Or are you just parroting what you heard? Some things people tell me belong to them don't really belong to them. Some people tell me certain things that God will do for people, and that's not what the book says. There's actually some serious contradiction. What actually belongs to you? So to have an effective prayer life, you have to have 
a working knowledge of the Word. James 2 tells us, and we're not going to go there for sake of time, but you can read James 2, and what James 2 is going to tell you is that faith without corresponding actions is dead. dead. It's no faith. Faith without actions is dead. It is no faith. Believing is actually a verb, by the way. To believe or believing is a verb. It's an action word. And there is actually no believing without acting. You hear people say, Lord, oh, I just need... What the, what the passage in the Bible, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, huh? Uh... Oh, pray for me that I might have more faith. And I, I don't want you to condemn yourself because you struggle with, with believing. But I want to leave another with you this morning. When it comes to this believing thing, don't try to believe. Don't try to believe. Just act. Okay? Don't try to believe. Just act. I, I like what Alicia said. I, it's like... Doing something that you couldn't do before. If you couldn't kick your leg up and you're here to pray, it's like kick the leg. Do something you couldn't do before. I told you about me jacking up my wrist, lifting Shannon's broken sled off of that trailer, dropping it at his house. It was four of us, but that was a heavy thing to just because you couldn't start it up. You turn it. A four-cycle snowmobile upside down, it pukes all the oil out. You just got to cart it off manpower-wise. Set my wrist pop. I couldn't even hold a cup of coffee. I couldn't open the door with my wrist. Robin said, here's my brace, wear it to Torrington when you drive that car. You know, so that's what I did. It kind of the mobile I had hurt so bad. And it happened, that happened the day before. You know, and it was like, and guys in the back, boy, they got a praying bunch of inmates up there at Torrington. They're going to get you cornered. They took me back there in the back, and they said, we want you to take that thing off. We're going to pray for you. God's going to heal you. So they prayed for me, and they said, now I want you to begin to do what you couldn't do just a little while ago. Huh? Quit struggling to believe. Just act. Amen. Just do it. I don't have to do the theological thing with this thing with the guys back there. You know, they didn't have to give me the little, the little, the little spin. It's just, who they are. <laughs> just act. So, in ignorance of what believing is, is really, it's an enemy of prayer. Believing is just acting. Just act on the word. I have, I have, I have need, Father. Okay, I prayed about it. I'm just going to begin to act upon the word. I'm, I'm going to have a very. I'm not going to be stressed. I'm going to have a good night's sleep. I trust you. I trust you. Rick and I talked about this recently, and it's like I need to preach a message one of these days on watching your words. It's really. I, I struggle. I'll be honest. There are times I struggle. With words. I'm not talking about, you know, saying something a little, old, you know, a little old bad words that you shouldn't say. I'm talking about, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the high priest of my confession. You didn't get born again by a magic prayer. You know, that, we've talked a lot about that in recent. You got born again by confessing Him as Lord of your life. And confessing Him as Lord of your life isn't a one-time confession. It's like, like, you know, I remember July the 14th, 1984, I confessed Jesus as Lord. It is a daily confessing Him as Lord. Because you're going to be in the middle of a battle. Sometimes you're going to feel like anything but a child of God. That's the truth. So it's a daily. If you will confess, Romans 10 9, if you will confess Jesus as 
Lord. He's the high priest of my confession. When I confess him as Lord, I give him something to work with. Now, I can give him a lot of other things, but he, he can't work with some of that stuff. He can't work with gloom, despair, and agony on me. He can't work with, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. I have to give him the word. Yep. In fact, Hebrews said he is the high priest of our confession. Hebrews also said, hold fast to your confession. Because in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the struggle, you're not going to want to hold fast to the confession. You're going to want to speak doubt and unbelief. We got our little timeline. It ain't happened according to my timeline. So I confess it was Lord. And I believe everything the Lord says about him. I step out of this family into this family. I begin to live in obedience. If I live in obedience, I want to make heaven my home. But if I choose to be the rebel, and I choose to walk in my disobedience, I fear for that person. Let me give some good examples of just you know, holding fast to your confession. I have a need. What does the Word say about my need? He'll meet it. He'll meet all my needs according to what? His riches and glory. That's what the Word says. See, your book, Bible is a textbook. You need to go through and mark some of this stuff. That's, that's why you're studying it to be the workman. That need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. I, I begin to mark my Bible. This is what it says. Because this is what the Word says. And that begins to be my confession. Not what someone else said. Not what someone else said. What the Word says. What the Word says. Amen. The Bible also says, when I pray according to His will, He hears me. What is His will? His Word. Here's His will. When I pray according to His will, He hears me. And if I know that He hears me, because I've been... Praying according to... I'm this, I am this student of the Word. I can rightly divide the Word of truth. I've been praying according to His Word. His will. He hears me. Then it says, If I know that He hears me, I have the petition that I desire of Him. Isaiah says, He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastised my peace was upon me, that by his stripes I might be healed. Spirit, soul, and body. I'm a triune being. Healed. That's what we need to do sometimes. We need to pull all of the scripture from that new covenant that has to do with healing baby girl. And we get us a, we get us a, in our study, we get us one of them binders, and we just begin to write it. And then we begin to rehearse it. We take it like a medicine. Yeah. Robin's, Robin's, at Penn, they, they were telling us all the time up there in Casper, you know, that it was, that was just a, a pressure ulcer, and it was really infection in the bone. The doctor here freaked out. They got her on some really powerful antibiotics, and they're they got a little bit of a side adverse, you know, a bad, a bad effect. And he said, "Don't matter. Take them. Take them to the very end." So we we have a prescription, and we take our prescription yeah. daily. 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 You read the bottle. Take daily. I take it daily. I take it daily. I surround myself with, with healing scripture. Healing scripture. I take it daily. The Bible says His word is a medicine. He says in the word, I'm weak. When I'm weak, He's strong. 
The Bible says his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Some have been trying to pack something God don't want you to pack. Right. To bear something you don't, he don't want you to bear. He said, he said, come unto me all you that are that, that labor or heavy laden and I will give you rest. My, let me take the load off of you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You need to mark this down. These are the things you need to take and rehearse. You need to watch your words. He says in the Word, in Matthew 6, He says, Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things will be out of you. What things is He talking about? Talk about everything that everybody out there in the work today world is fighting for. Got to pay my rent. You know, got to get some groceries down the city market. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? And He said, Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. All these things will be added to you. He didn't necessarily mean that, a, that the check is going to show up in the mailbox tomorrow morning. It may be that you actually got to get up off the couch and go do something. But God will open up the door. He will make a way to take care of you. He says in the Word, I will delight myself in Psalm 37. If I, and I'm just giving you some examples. He says in Psalm 37, if I delight myself in the Lord, He'll do what? You give me the desires of my heart. He's not, he's not sugar daddy down at Walmart that every time you walk down the toy section, he's going to take and buy you something. But if you will chase hard after him, yep. instead of chasing after the Walmart trinkets, he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. In fact, I'm the one that put the desire there. I put it there. And so these are the things that I speak back to my high priest. He is the high priest of my confession. So I hold fast to my confession. Amen. Amen. You know what hold fast means? James also says a double-minded man will receive. One day he believes this, and the next day he's down in the Blue despair and agony on me. Pity party, I'm kicking the, 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 the chair. It's like I'm shaking my fist to God. And, huh? Yeah. No. <coughs> Don't talk doubt and unbelief and failure and lack. They're the enemies of your prayer. Yeah. It's an enemy of your prayer. It's an enemy of your prayer. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Hope is always future. Hope has to do with expectancy. Amanda was expecting. She's not expecting no more. You know that. Huh? Yeah. They got the little baby that Levi is holding. Asher. Asher's right over there. Faith is always now. Hope is always future. Do you know that hopers very seldom get their prayers answered? Hopers don't get their prayers answered. It's men and women of faith. I am a student of the Word. I stand upon the Word no matter what the circumstance or the situation looks like. Yes, they that penitentiary. Sister had a great word out of Psalms 46. It said, be still and know that I'm God. Huh? You're in the middle of something and it's just, be still. Know that I'm God. Metal ascent is like that bird again. It's like the parrot. It's like, we believe the word. And I got, I got 15 different study Bibles at the house. I go to church all the time. Just head knowledge. It's all it is is head knowledge. I mean, that becomes the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I hardly ever miss. And you may love what you read from Genesis to Revelation. You may believe it's the infallible Word of God. And like I said, I have 15 different Bibles at home. 
But when it comes to acting on it, that's just totally a different story. A doer of the word is not a hearer only. Not just head knowledge. It's not just head knowledge. And there's some incredible stories there. We'll talk about some of them here in just a moment. You know, praying for faith. Have you ever heard somebody pray for faith? That's a prayer of unbelief. Every one of you here were given a major faith. Let's, let's bring up the screen. Romans 12, 3. Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you are, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Out of that penitentiary years past, they had a cafeteria style chow line. And they, they ultimately did away with it. They, they got a bean shoot. And part of that is, it's like, you know the meat doesn't always come in perfect sizes, right? And so you got this great big old thing full of meat. The big old boy looks at you and you go slap a piece of meat on his tray and he looks at you and it's like, you just gave him the big one. You're giving me the little one? I mean, I'll put another bump on your head later back in the block. So they, they, they went to a bean shoot. Now they feed in the box, but... In the bean shoot, you couldn't see the guy. You couldn't look at it. And, you know, yes, I want more of that dessert. I love pumpkin pie. You know, I love bacon and pumpkin pie. It's like you couldn't do that. So you just got the issue. Well, the Bible says that every, every one of you have received an issue yep. of faith. That's right. The Bible talks about if we had the faith as a grain of mustard seed, we could say to the mountains in our life, be gone, and they would be gone. I got my mustard seed of faith. It don't have to remain a mustard seed of faith. The story says if I plant that mustard seed, it grows into this plant, this bush that actually birds can actually roost in. So Romans 10:17. That's the kid up there. Romans 10:17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word. So you, you want to be this great man or woman of prayer? <laughs> is Rollins worth it? Is your family worth it? Is your destiny, your future worth it? Yeah. Yeah. I've been given this place when I, when I, when I got born again. And I, I got a brand new definition of born again. I love it. Born again is just simply, again, is that not, not that magic little prayer? Born again is saying, like we've all said at times, man, if I could have a do-over button, I would really do this over. I, I, I've really messed up. You ever want to do things over? Huh? Anybody here not want to do things over? Oh, yeah. I have. If you ever want to do things over, Gail? Dear God, if I could just go back and do that over. And God said, okay, I'll give you a do-over button. You must be born again. It's, it's a brand new life. That's your do-over button. It's a brand new life. So I get born again. And it gives me the measure of faith. And then I begin to feed upon the Word. And as I feed upon the Word, what begins to happen? Begin My faith begins to grow. Yep. That's what begins to happen. Yep. Where I couldn't even, I couldn't even believe him for a pair of socks. <laughs> I can now at least believe him for the shoes to go with the socks. Huh? Yep. I mean, we're making progress. I've shared this before, Joshua, that first chapter. What a, a fierce responsibility. 
try to fill Moses' shoes. And so in the middle of him kind of feeling overwhelmed, that was a lot of people. He says to him, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And then he tells him down in that, I think we're on the 8th verse, something like that, he says that you're to meditate on, on this word, day and night. We're thinking, when he says, he said, meditate on the word, the law, the word, he's not talking about Leviticus. If you'll meditate on the, the meal offering, you know, the free will offering, you'll have good success. No, he, what was he to meditate on? As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Whatever is your circumstance or situation, whatever you find yourself in the middle of, God has a, has a remedy for it, and you're to meditate on that thing, day and night. Now, meditate means this. means mutter. In other words, you're speaking to yourself. Faith comes by... Let's go back to, to, to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing the preacher? No. I only hear one day out of the week. If it's from hearing the preacher, you're, you're in trouble. Huh? You're in trouble. We have a little advantage in the fact that we got we got we got iPhones and we get podcasts and all kinds of stuff off of YouTube. But uh, that hasn't always been the case. Hearing what? Hearing you. It, it needs to be coming out of your mouth. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of, his, of, of my peace was on by his stripes. I am healed. <laughs> my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That's what... But you can't be the parent. You can't, you can't be just saying like, like the little bird going... Peek-a-boo! Yeah. Peek-a-boo! Yeah. All him on a cracker. Peek-a-boo! <laughs> it's got to be the word that you fed on this down here. You have a need. You went through and you looked up the healing. You have looked up whatever your need is. Whatever you desire. I want, I want a deeper relationship with God. He says in His Word, if you will seek for me with all your heart, yes. you will find me. Yeah. So God, I am going to begin to run after you and I'm going to seek you with all of, of my heart because your Word says that if I do, yes. I'll find you. And in finding Him, I'm going to have this incredible supernatural relationship. The very thing that I desire John 15, 7. Let's go there really quick. John 15, 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. There's a clause there. You notice that. You ever see these little things in the, you know, they got the advertising. You're turning through the newspaper or and more, more probably in the magazine. And it's like, boy, this month is 0% financing. They've deducted, I mean, they've knocked $20,000 off this truck and 0% financing. And they'll throw in all of this stuff. And you're thinking, I'm headed to the dealership today. And then you look down, they got some little teeny fine print down the bottom. Huh? Conditions. <sighs> okay, well, I can either have the the big 20% discount or the 0% financing, or I can only have the 0% financing for three months, and then I got to go back to regular, I'm not three months, three years, and then I go back to the other three or four, I go back to a regular uh, interest break. I mean, it's like the small print. Well, there's a small print here. And the, and the word that is if. It's if. If you remain in me, what's remain in me mean? Stay connected. Stay connected. we got relationship. Yep. You aren't the prodigal son on a walkabout somewhere, huh? Yep. 
If, if you remain in me, and then my word remains in you, then you can ask whatever. You're not living loosely. You're not living loose. You're living in Him. You're living in Him. So you are, you're, 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 you live in the Word, and you act on the Word, you're in a relationship, and while in that, you have power in your prayer life. Yes. Heard, these are areas where people get really frustrated because they don't understand the enemies of prayer. And they're like, I'm praying. It didn't work. Hmm. Well, why didn't it work? And rather than, uh, it's like, I do some self examination. Get ready to wind this thing down. There's a lot of self deluders in the church world today. They talk a lot about the word. You know the talk is cheap. You've probably heard that one before too, huh? Paul, talk is cheap. Huh? <laughs> it is. Talk is cheap, Levi. For people that talk about the word, they'll even post it on their Facebook post. They got the beautiful mountain scene. They got what is maybe one of the scriptures that really, it was the mountain scene that probably caught the eye of all of the scripture because they haven't really spent time in the Word. It was just a beautiful picture and it maybe fit with something or somebody. And it's like, post, post, okay. Huh? But they don't practice the Word. So talk is just cheap. They don't practice the Word. Talk is cheap. They're not word people. They're probably one of cracker people. They're peekaboo people. Peekaboo. Peekaboo. <laughs> how do I know? Let me tell you how I know. See, the Bible says you know something by its fruit. I'm not judging nobody. They don't do their own praying. That's one of the big signs that you know somebody. If it's like... <laughs> Now, there's a place for corporate prayer. And I love prayer chains. Something big going down, it's like, man, let's get the, let's get the, the prayer people a going. Let's get the army gathered. Huh? Let's, let's get them in agreement. Let's get them flowing here. But there is a place where I'm telling you what, you need to grow up. God wants that relationship. Amen. And he does. Yes, he does. He wants to have intimate this relationship. intimate yes, he does. relationship. With all of us. And so if by the fruit, one of the fruits is when people are doing their own praying and God's doing stuff, you know they have a relationship. Yes. Huh? They have become skilled in their prayer. They're not the ones that are always looking for somebody to do it for them. Yeah. You know that taking time in prayer and time in the Word uh, is work. You know that? Yes, it, is. it is actually work. You actually have to set aside time. You have to make time. You have to make time. Yeah. It's work. There are a lot of things in our life that work. There's a lot of things at times we don't feel like doing. Yeah. If we've had that snow and that bitter cold. Yeah. I shoveled these walks all the way over here and back. And I did mine and I did my neighbor's lady. And I can tell you, I didn't feel like it. <laughs> like I said, you know, I'll wait till closer to noon. Hopefully it will warm up a little. Because I could use the real cold for an excuse. It was below zero this week, huh, Levi? I could use that for an excuse. I was like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not going out there. Yeah. It was a lot of work. But it had to be done. Yeah. Huh? And actually, once I got out there and got to do it, it wasn't like half bad. I actually kind of enjoyed myself, you know? And that's like a lot of things in life. 
What's your priority? What is your priority? So I find out that I find for myself personally that when I begin to pray, it actually becomes kind of enjoyable. Amen. I actually have some really fierce moments with God. Amen. I find out that when I spend time in the Word, consistently and regularly, what happens is all of a sudden God begins to give me nuggets. And it's like, wow. There are times I've actually sat here with my Bible, had to just back away for a moment, and I just begin to weep before the Lord. The revelation was just, it was, it just brought to my soul. Begin to pray in my heavenly prayer language. Yep. Just begin to worship or just just read. Yep. True story. You know another thing that will reveal somebody's prayer life? Their own conversations. The Bible says, "Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth talks." All you gotta do is just, just kind of sit down. You just, you just listen. How you doing? You know, you just have a conversation. You just listen, huh? And then all of a sudden, it's like, it's all what's in the heart, huh? Sunday, we're really good. We are. <laughs> huh? We're all dressed up. We all kind of smell good, huh? <laughs> smell good, we shaved. Well, all parts of us. <laughs> parts. You know, fixed our hair all up. Cody always smells really good. Yeah. He smells really good, you know. We, we like good cologne. We're not into the Walmart special. <laughs> we we like to go up to Coles. Coles and Casper has wonderful. You can go in there and get yourself all spoofed up for free too. <laughs> you know, you can try out. You can be like, smell this. One. What do you think? Pretty soon you smell like a collage. You know, it's like we love good cologne. Want to close? I invite you to our prayer time. God is looking for some mighty men and women of prayer. Every great move of God has been preceded by two things. And I say again, it's raw and it's worth it. The two things are repentance and prayer. I've had to do a lot of repentance here lately. Let's talk about that for just a moment. we got five minutes. See, when I invited Christ in my heart and life, the sin issue was taking care of past, present, future. Because he, he became my sin. He bore the penalty of my sin. But first, John 1, 9 comes into play. And that's the relationship part of this thing. It's me and Robin in the morning and somebody's crabby patty and before the day's over, you need to take care of that. We've talked about that before. Otherwise, you're going to get a large part of the bed tonight. Huh? So you take care of the, the Krabby Patty stuff. And sometimes we take, need to take care of the Krabby Patty stuff with our, our Father God. You know, we misbehaved. And so First yeah. John 1, 9 says, If we confess that sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But beyond all of that, God's dealt with me with things out of my past. Not, not sin that I need to, to confess. But things that I have done that have hurt people. And I'm not talking about hurt people going to be in jail kind of stuff. I'm talking about I sat down with my mama this week. And I said to my mama, there were times my dad really needed me. And I was a flake. He 
needed me like quivers in his, or arrows in his quiver. And he invented, I'd show up at their doorstep all the time. Mm-hmm. Now I'd be off on another gallivant. I said to my mama, Mama, I'm really sorry. Something I need to take care of. I hurt you and dad. Huh? I hurt you and dad. I hurt you and dad. I let you down. I let you down. I'm sorry. God's given me an amazing wife. You may find this hard to believe, but I haven't always appreciated the gift. She walked up a million miles with me. She endured a lot of hardship. And it's easy sometimes to... Yeah, or just really not appreciate it. You know that not very many girls would get up on a Saturday morning when it's a blizzard. Walk up that hill into that penitentiary and across that yard to where when you hit K unit, her hair is just literally a snowball. And it's down inside of her coat. And you gotta brush it off and she's wet. And she's there and she needs to brush it. And not many, many girls I can, you know that. Paul was telling me the other night about Marlene. Oh, <laughs> All those three years, three years, she's like the postman snow rain, Steve or Dale, she was there. Huh? Wow. She's amazing. And Paul was like, what a gift, what a treasure I have. And Marlene. Those are some of the things that when I say, you know, we need to repent. We come back and we say, oh, God. I just need to clear the air up here. I finally grew up enough in my life to recognize what's happened. And what I have and the treasures and what's important. And appreciate. And appreciate. And I'm telling you something wonderful happens when you do it. God asks me, he says, why are you repenting? See, because the sin issue is taken care of. If you repent because of the sin issue, it's like God said, don't do it. Don't do it. That's taken care of. But if we're having this me and you thing, this really intimate thing, then this is wonderful. You've come to a place in your life that I long for you to come to. Then, out of that is birthed real prayer. And those are the two things that you mark, that marks every revival, every great move of God. That's what fills altars up. It's not, it's not you, you, you running down to an altar. Trying to get born again for the fifteenth hundred time. <laughs> it's you coming down to the altar and the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you. And say to Rick, Rick ain't me, and I'm not him. There are times I'll tell you I've been pretty frustrated with him. 
ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਨਹੀਂ that door just reset the arms around and I said break mm-hmm. I love you mm-hmm. I really love you brother mm-hmm. <laughs> so free You can't hardly keep still, Gail. You want to dance a little. You want to run. Huh? You want to show. Let's stand together. (coughs) Father, I thank you for these wonderful, wonderful people. And from the depth of my heart, taking this word that you...